Well, I mean, when you look at what, what you were doing back then, and you look at, for example, Vlad TV, which, you know, we definitely look back at what you were doing as, as a blueprint, you know, but well, what I do these days does focus a lot, a lot on controversy, does focus on beef. You know, my interviews are not, aren't always comfortable. You know, we talk about, you know, people have cried in my interviews. Uh, people have gotten angry in my interviews. Like a lot of deep personal things came out. You really didn't choose that route when you did your interviews back then. Was there a reason why you avoided certain topics and just focused on more of the positive stuff? You know, I, I think it's a, that's, that's a good question. And I've watched what you do. It's really unique. I don't think the audience obviously realizes that Vlad is not here right now. So I'm, this, I'm, I'm into this tech stuff and I'm talking to Vlad on a computer screen on the other side of the country. Be, but I watch what you do and I like the fact that the interviewer is removed from the situation. You know your presence there, but you just focus on the individual, which I think is very reflective of what is going on now, that everybody can pull their phones out and almost have that same moment with them themselves. Um, but the format of Yo! MTV Raps didn't allow the kind of in-depth, open-ended interview that you can do and set your own guidelines and parameters based on the technology and that you own your own network, essentially, which is amazing when you think about it. We had about two to three minutes a segment to talk to the artists. It was a very specific business. We had to mention the name of the record, the doom, -do -do, pull some flavor out, which was my thing. Like, tell me how you did it. Was it the beats and then the lyrics or the lyrics and the beats? You know, why are we in this dingy basement like with the Dungeon family, which was literally like something that was just carved out. It just had a, a vibe and an energy to it. So you try to struggle to get a little bit of substance, a little bit of reality, pick a location where the audience could like know what it's like to be in Harlem, Brooklyn, South Central. That was what Your MTV Raps was about. That was what our mission was. It wasn't to do that more in-depth, introspective, deep to the core type of interview, which I think is works great for the internet in this format that you guys do. So it's a good thing. The way you've evolved with this, I remember meeting you close to about 10 years ago now, and you broke down a lot of how there was the beginning of people monetizing YouTube. And you were really on, I remember, I remember being really impressed with how you detailed what was going on as you were building your platform at the same time Worldstar was coming up. I know you and Q from Worldstar were were buddies, both were as aspiring DJs, and you kind of almost inadvertently stumbled into this thing, which you were in the, you, you stumbled at the right time, obviously. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're right, because in a show, it's almost like similar to a radio format, where when a guest comes on the show, you get some interview snippets, but they're playing music along the way, so you don't really have a long form format. Right in that type of thing, you know? And then around that time, the, the interviewers that did get into more of the drama type stuff, for example, like Dee Barnes, you saw the whole situation where, you know, Dr. Dre caught her in a club and ended up kicking her down some stairs. And, you know, that's still being discussed to, to this day. Because I think in a way, a lot of the interviewers were kind of, so I think some were scared of the artists some wanted to be friends with the right. artist, so True. it ends up being more of a, a promo PR type format. Yeah. Right. And um, yeah, it was just very different back then where I, I just chose to say, fuck all that, I'm gonna go completely different. I'm gonna go like a 60 minutes type of approach very good, with, with yes. what I do. But um, I think there's a place for both, totally. you know, absolutely. You know, when I talked to Ralph McDaniels, you know, his thing was like, well, I just love hip hop. I didn't wanna have anything negative put out there about it, so. That that's how he wanted to do it, but hey, man, listen. I think what you what you lay down is absolutely amazing, and uh, I think the contribution still reverberates these days, uh, not only on the music but of the art, and you know, and of the business because ultimately nobody was putting money into hip hop back then. That's true. That's true. I mean, it was amazing the resistance 
to the culture coming up. And I often think of the fact that I'm continually amazed, I want to say, nobody could have seen this continuing to go on for so long. Um, and when I think about why that is, I think it has to do with the fact that the roots of this culture were so honest and so sincere. It's like, first and foremost, it was like, I'm somebody, I exist, I'm here, and I'm going to make you recognize me because you really have it, you know? So that was really the, 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 a big engine in driving this was to force yourself upon those that wasn't trying to check for you and to just sincerely and honestly state the fact that I'm here. And the roots of that went down really, really deep. Um, at a time when they were, it was a things were allowed to develop, and really, once again, the roots were allowed to go deep. And when the roots go deep, a, a tree can grow to enormous proportions. And the fact that this culture was able to translate, once again, I'm a big part of the first tour that went out of this country in 1982, with along with the Rocksteady crew and graffiti artists and a just the whole spectrum all went to France and toured about 10 cities, a couple of gigs in England with going, look, we're going to have a good time. Nobody's going to understand a word that we're saying or not much more than a few words, if you will. But let's just have fun up there and throw our hands in the air, waving like we just don't care. Those roots took, took over there and turned France into the second biggest market for hip hop in the world. And every part of the world that has access to any kind of communication, people are rapping, people are spray painting, doing street art, finding, you know, incredible dance moves are going on. So really phenomenal that this continues. And I think it's because of those deep roots. Well, yeah, I mean, I came from Russia and I was born in what used to be the Soviet Union. Oh, I didn't and know I, that. Yeah, yeah. I was born in Kiev in the Ukraine, which at the time was part of the USSR. I, when I did you come over. over? I came over when I was about five years old. Okay. Well, are you aware of, uh, this is the only Russian rapper, I always remember this guy's name, Bogdan Titomir? No idea. Okay, so back in the early 90s, there was a Russian chick I knew, and she was telling me all about this. She had dated him for a hot minute. This dude had ripped off the whole MC Hammer swag, the baggy pants and the whole nine, and was killing it in Russia, huge, because they didn't have access to the fact that he was copying MC Hammer. So he blew up, occasionally I meet people from Russia, I drop that name, they'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe you know Bogdan Titomir. Yeah, well, by that time I was already in America. So. Yeah, no, you, you. <laughs> I, I missed that whole thing. But what I was gonna say is I interviewed uh, Oxymiron, who's one of the, the big Russian rappers, and he's telling me how Hip hop is the dominant form of music in Russia. I never thought that, Ru that Russia would really embrace hip hop like that. Right now, hip hop is the main music in Russia. It, we have overtaken rock a long time ago and now we're huh. overtaking pop, you know? So, and that's mostly done not through TV or radio, it's all through YouTube and, and social media. So it's almost like a revolution of, of music going on. Everyone listens to hip hop, you know? And it's gonna grow further, it's a huge market. Yo. And then I interviewed Chris Wu, who's one of the big Chinese rappers, and he's telling me how hip hop is now dominating the charts in China. Yeah. I love hip hop music. Like, I love hip hop and I love the culture. And uh, after I moved back to China, I realized that, just like what you said, it wasn't, it wasn't mainstream, it wasn't that big. You know, a lot of people don't know what it is, it was super underground. Um, and I tried to, I wanted to do something about it, you know. I wanted to see if I can get more people, you know. To, to learn and to like this culture. So I come across this show called Rap of China, which is like the voice, but rapping, but rap music, hip hop music. Um, and then I said, um, and I decided to, to, to come on board. I decided to be one of the judge on the show. And then uh, that was last year when, when, the, uh, the, uh, when that show started and it, become a huge, it became a huge success all over China. And that kind of really, um, put a spotlight on hip hop and kind of changed a lot of things and um, made it, uh, and just more people got to know what hip hop is and what rap music is like. Um, 
so yeah, I, I did that, and then uh, yeah, that's that's what I did to kind of change the game up a little bit <laughs> for China. Yeah, totally. You know these communist countries. Yes. So it's just so mind blowing. And then it you know I, I went to Belgium. And there was a uh, b-boy competition, and all the Korean break it. dancers were killing it, killing I know, everybody. It's amazing. Yeah, I'd man, see, hip hop. I, yo, that's for me one of the greatest um, uh, bolts of energy that I get is meeting people from these remote places, and oftentimes your MTV raps or having gotten a VHS tape three or four generations down and how that um, helped them. But recently hearing about hip hop in these places like Mongolia, there's a Mongolian, I got buddies in China, I was in China a, a couple of times, but there's a Mongolian scene coming up really strong. And just recently there was an election in Thailand, some guy dropped a, a rap record going at the kind of totalitarian governments and uh, making becoming a really big part of the di dynamic um, through the culture. So these kind of stories continually amaze me that um, it still rocks on and rocks strong in so many places. It's, it's uh, really amazing. Yeah, man, absolutely. And I think the important part was that you documented so much of those early stages with iconic groups like Outkast and NWA and Biggie and Tupac. And, and that's really my goal behind Vlad TV is to really take what you've done and try to document this era of hip hop because everyone that I interview will never be that age again, will never be that mindset again, will never look like that again, will never sound like that again. And it's so important for the generations to come that we document this and a lot of my interviews are biopic style interviews where, you know, that artist may not be big enough to get a big, you know, Netflix documentary, but Vlad TV will document that person's story for generations to come. And, and that's, that's my goal. And I think that I really took a lot of what you did and continued it. And, and hopefully I can make a, a similar type of impact. No, I, I think, I think that's, that's really cool to hear you say that Vlad, but I think once again, the format you've created is a very interesting and engaging format. I'm fascinated how uh, comfortable people get with you, how revealing uh, people can be, um, how you, it's, 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 it's really quite fascinating. And it's interesting. And I think it's a testament to the fact that people have a relationship with you. But what's interesting is sitting here, seeing you almost in a like, quick time format on this uh, computer screen is really like a surreal, almost, I don't know, a lot of people may not remember, but MTV had a show for a hot minute called Max Headroom, and it was this digital character that would kind of pop up and a kind of a precursor to what we live with now, this ability to, for all of us to kind of invade people's airwaves and stuff like that. But no, it's really good what you've done and it's interesting the way you have developed this and are able to uh, to be bicoastal and to still have what is an engaging interview. It's really fascinating. I've never done anything like this. <laughs> well, thank you, man. That 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 means a lot coming ah, from Fab Five cool. Freddy. And man, I just want to once again circle it back to my film Grass Is Greener because I I I threw in a little bit of my Yo MTV Raps history and connected that, those dots. Because once again, you know, introducing Snoop, Cypress Hill, a lot of those guys made their national TV debuts on my show. Um, and then realizing that they were instrumental in um, advocating for the, for the legalization of the plant, now have been victorious in California. It's, come on, I, I just, when I was coming up with the ideas for Grass is Greener, I said, wait a minute, these guys hit my show early, mid 90s, and out and loud and proud about cannabis and the plant and whatever, coincided with California getting medical, and now California being legal, and rewinding to those moments, like I have a clip of when, in my film, when I interview Cypress Hill and these, uh, like Be Real has a Humboldt hat on and 
you know, and then to get the full story of how they were not just trying to be a Cheech and Chong meets Run DMC kind of group, but they wanted to be activists about the plant because they were aware that the government had kept so many things from us. And I just think like shows like yours and opportunities to kind of look back and reflect on this history is pretty interesting because the whole archive of what you've done um, is a snapshot of where the culture is and where the culture is going and people's ability to, ref to reflect and want to engage with you um, on this computer screen is pretty amazing. Thank you, man. Well, listen, everyone check that. out. <laughs> everyone check out Grass is Greener on Netflix right now. Uh, very dope documentary. Uh, Fat Five Freddy. I'm glad we finally got to do this after a decade. Yeah, uh, it's just too long. Sorry, wait. For oh, by the way, there's also a Grass is Greener soundtrack. Salam Remy, who's a cousin, did all the music in the film. And then we got some dope acts to do a soundtrack. Jada Kiss, Bun B, Stephen Marley, Black Dot, a real dope listen. Um, people just hitting those tracks that are the, the foundation of the music in the movie. Oh, yeah, man. I know Salam Remy. I've known him for a while. I actually interviewed him. Uh, incredible musician. Super incredible. talented. And I actually, I, I actually got a chance to listen to the, document, to the uh, soundtrack. Very dope as well. Yeah, I like to describe Salam as the greatest producer too few people know about. Everybody from Nas and Lauren Hill and the Fugees to Amy Winehouse. He was, you know, foundation producer for her. He's an amazing guy. And uh, grass is green. Yeah, man. Grass is greener, man. Go watch it. Fat Five Freddy, thank you so much for telling your story. Thanks, uh, Vlad. Just, you know, looking forward to the projects you keep coming out with, man. Listen, You're still doing Listen, when you come it. to New York, you got to get at me because my studio, I have some incredible new work I need to show you, too. I remember that's one of the things that we talked about back then. He's like, yo, I'm talking about this art stuff. Next week, man. Let's do it next week. There we go. Got to get you up to Harlem and show you some work, baby. I'm down. Let's do it. My man. Thanks, Vlad. Peace. Peace.